Uh, okay, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you all for coming. It's uh, exciting here to welcome our speaker, Reverend Dr. John Payne. Uh, he said no long introduction. Uh, he only wanted to be referred to as a sinner saved by grace. Um, and we can all say our amen to that, but I'll, I'll go ahead and give an introduction anyway. Um, uh, he's the, the pastor of, of Christ Church Presbyterian in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, uh, in the PCA, uh, executive director of Reformation um, uh, Network, Gospel Reformation Network. Uh, editor and contributor to a number of volumes, uh, not least the, the absolutely terrific Lectio Continua uh, commentary series on the New Testament, uh, titles on uh, the Heidelberg Catechism and the Belgic Confession, and uh, recovering reformed worship in the 21st century, and so it's very exciting to have him here as our speaker today. Uh, we'll hand over to, to Reverend Payne, and then he'll speak, and then I'm sure we'll have time at the end for questions. Uh, so thank you all. Thank you, Zach. It's uh, wonderful to be with you here. Uh, today, uh, I've been over uh, for a conference in uh, Newcastle uh, at the rival seminary down uh, on the other side of the border uh, at Westminster Presbyterian Theological Seminary. And uh, the conference was on mission. Uh, I do want to uh, encourage you, uh, if you uh, were not watching those at all online, which you probably weren't because you have your own studies here, but they do have a YouTube channel. And uh, I was personally just very, very encouraged by the messages that I was able to hear at the conference. And it was all on mission. And uh, if anyone needs a constant encouragement and reinforcement of uh, the need for uh, bold and courageous evangelism and uh, a proper view of mission in the church. It's, it's, uh, it's Reformed Presbyterians and Reformed Baptists here. Reformed Baptists here, we need to be reminded of these things uh, because we often uh, forget them. Uh, it's so wonderful to be back in, in Edinburgh. My uh, wife and I, we lived here uh, in the early 2000s, uh, did postgraduate work at the University of Edinburgh. And a piece of our heart is in this city. Our oldest daughter was born uh, in this city. And uh, it's, it's just uh, lovely to be with you here. Uh, wonderful to see Ivor uh, Martin again and uh, to, to spend time with you. Uh, Zach reached out a few, um, I guess a couple of months ago now, and uh, Zach had, had gotten wind that I was, I was going to be in the area and uh, kindly invited me to uh, address you on uh, the topic of uh, the courage to be Presbyterian. Now, if you're a Baptist here today, I'm sorry, you could just put in Baptist there because there's a lot of <laughs> uh, very much uh, the same kinds of, of things that, that we would be thinking about here from God's Word would apply to you uh, as well. Of course, one day we do hope you will be able to, to, to be a courageous Presbyterian uh, in the future, uh, but we'll leave that uh, to, to the Lord um, and to the persuasiveness of your professors. Um, but if you would, if you'd open your Bibles uh, with me to uh, Hebrews chapter 12, if you have your Bible uh, with you, uh, I am going to be drawing uh, from uh, Hebrews chapter 12 uh, during our time uh, together. Uh, but let me, uh, let me please open us in prayer. Our Father, we thank you so much for your tender mercies and your love. Lord, before we are pastors or professors or seminary principals uh, or seminary students, uh, before we are anything, Lord, we are objects of your sovereign mercy. We are those who have benefited uh, so gloriously from your, your grace, your mercy, your kindness, your love. And we pray, uh, Lord, that uh, from our time together uh, today, you would uh, remind us um, what it is to be courageous in our ministries uh, and to be warm-hearted confessional Presbyterians or Baptists. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would uh, strengthen our hands, uh, that you would be the lifter of our heads, uh, that you would help us to persevere and to be strong 
uh, in the strength of the Lord as we carry on in our studies, uh, in our ministries, uh, and in all things, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Courage. Courage is uh, something that uh, a lot of people have been talking about these days because it's becoming more and more difficult to be a Christian in Western civilization. Many people are uh, writing about it. Many people are speaking on it and mentioning it that no longer uh, is Western civilization governed by a Christian worldview. Uh, When we look at uh, our government, when we tap the average person on the shoulder on the street and begin asking them simple questions on morality, we find uh, that no longer are people responding in the ways they would have responded, say, 30 or 40 years ago. There would have been a, a conventional answer that would have connected in some way to a Christian morality, and we are not seeing that anymore. We are more like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, in uh, Babylon. Uh, we are more like Daniel in Babylon. We are more like uh, the prophets who look around and, and uh, wonder if anybody Uh, believes the same things that we believe uh, anymore. Now, of course, that's a bit of of an exaggeration. Uh, We are thankful for uh, a a very large remnant that still is uh, around in in the UK and and America and and other places uh, in the West. Uh, However, we see the writing on the wall, uh, as it were, and we are recognizing that there is a newfound need for, for courage, for courage. Courage, I heard recently uh, stated, is the flower that is born out of the soil of conviction. Courage is the flower that is born or that comes out of the soil of uh, conviction. Uh, Without true biblical and confessional conviction, we will not show the courage that will need to be expressed in these challenging times. The book of Hebrews is full of strong exhortations and sobering warnings for the church throughout the ages. And it was originally written to encourage first century Jewish Christians not to abandon orthodoxy, not to abandon the gospel. It was a call to resist, to resist the seductive enticements of religious and cultural syncretism. I believe this is one of the biggest things facing the church today is this this enticement to uh, syncretize uh, cultural trends and and, uh, various religious uh, uh, techniques and methods that would lead us away from the means of grace. This urgent message uh, to persevere in the truth, no matter what, is a profoundly relevant one for our current cultural moment. And... Uh, It's why it's a joy for me to encourage you, the the students of this wonderful uh, institution, uh, to to resist uh, these trends, and uh, and in this case, uh, to resist the via media, to resist the via media. Intense cultural pressure and religious persecution made life difficult for Jewish believers in the first century. Being a Christian was never easy. Sometimes the biggest threats to uh, purity and and, and peace uh, and the unity of the church came from parties within, from within the church. Uh, The same challenges were true of the the great cloud of witnesses that the author to the Hebrews mentions, uh, those resolute believers of whom the world was not worthy. Faithfulness to Christ was an arduous and costly road for the Hebrew Christians. Consequently, the temptation to compromise and negotiate the truth was always before them. The satanic invitation to accommodate doctrinal error, syncretize truth with falsehood, and even apostatize could at times be palpable. Christian profession meant persecution on some level for these early Christians. Uh, You think about the early days of the book of Acts. We talk about the book of Acts in sort of flowery ways, uh, this golden age of the Christian church. If you think for a moment about the context of the book of Acts and the persecution that broke out against uh, the church under Saul 
and, uh, and, and the Jews, and then the Christians uh, uh, spreading out to Judea and Samaria, and for that persecution to continue uh, throughout those early centuries. Uh, the Christian church has seen this before, and uh, if, if there is another wave of major persecution uh, in our own civilization, uh, then we will not be alone. We will have many who have gone before us and who have stood firm uh, in that context. We certainly don't want this. We don't invite it. I remember in college, uh, people saying things like this, I want to pray for difficulty so I'll grow in the Lord. Oh my goodness, that is such nonsense. We don't pray for difficulties. We don't pray for persecution but we want to be on our toes, we want to be ready, and we don't want to be caught off guard. Christian profession meant persecution on some level for these early believers. There was a very real possibility of social, economic, and physical hardship for those who were indeed devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ and his objective truth. I'm sure it's been said in many of your classrooms uh, but it must be said over and over that if you're not ready and willing to serve the Lord in the midst of that kind of persecution, probably Christian ministry is not your thing. Every minister must be ready to serve the Lord at all costs. Uh, and I don't say that flippantly. It's a reality that we are in, and we must be courageous in the midst of it, as uh, were um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There was also a temptation for these early Christians to grow discouraged with the conflict and division within the church. And for the sake of peace and unity, some attempted to forge a kind of theological via media, seeking to amalgamate old covenant shadows with new covenant realities. The move to foster this middle way with those who taught doctrinal error, however, would only eclipse the glorious high priesthood of Christ subvert the true gospel, and sabotage the church's mission. Therefore, God's people were admonished in the book of Hebrews over and over and over again not to explore third-way options for the sake of religious respectability, cultural approval, or the peace of the church. We don't want to say peace at all costs. We must have unity, and so we must sort of bow the knee to these various trends in our culture. Oh no, uh, not at all. These early Christians were exhorted to persevere in God's way and to, quote, hold fast the confession of their hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Indeed, the temptation to broker God's truth for the sake of ecclesiastical unity and cultural acceptance is a perennial one. This is nothing new to our own day. We must firmly resist the temptation to negotiate biblical fidelity and confessional integrity. I don't know how much you know about what's going on in America, and I know there are some similar patterns here in the UK, but there is this kind of chipping away at orthodoxy not by sort of full-fledged liberalism, but a kind of progressivism that is slowly eroding orthodoxy. Things like side B gay Christianity, things like the social justice movement and CRT, uh, things like egalitarianism, and we could just keep uh, going down uh, the line and slowly with small compromises at the presbytery level and leadership level, uh, the teaching begins to be devoid of clarity as it concerns marriage and, and human sexuality. And so what you have is this kind of quiet acquiescence that's softly killing the church. We need men to stand up in pulpits and to clearly and boldly not shrink back from declaring the whole counsel of God. And to be clear, particularly on those areas where everybody is getting very confused because the messaging that's constantly coming at us um, I wish I had a copy for every one of you right now, and, and, and I don't. And Ivor, maybe we can talk later about getting uh, the men some of these. But uh, I worked with a friend of mine uh, back uh, home uh, from Escondido, California, Chris Gordon, who has just written a New Reformation Catechism on Human Sexuality. It is a catechism for the moment, and it's written in the style of the Heidelberg Catechism. It is extraordinarily pastoral. 
and it takes us from creation to the fall to redemption to restoration. And in, in all of these 41 questions and answers, it wonderfully and pastorally and warmly unpacks and compassionately unpacks the biblical teaching on human sexuality. That's the kind of thing that we need in our own day. And we need men to take it up and to teach it uh, and to give it to their congregations. But we must resist the temptation to negotiate the truth. Um, uh, and I want to encourage us from Hebrews 12, 12 through 17. Look with me there, if you would, Hebrews 12, 12 uh, through 17. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that, uh, to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent though he sought it with tears. Friends, the, the book of Hebrews is a, a ravishing portrait of the person and work of Christ. It's all about Jesus being better. He's, he's better than uh, Aaron. He's better than uh, all the priests. He's better than the angels because he's the, the eternal son of God. He's, he's better. Uh, his his all-sufficient mediatorial work is better than that of the old covenant shadows. It's the fulfillment and realization of them. And the church will do well to become more familiar with all of these ideas. Well, after personally spending some time uh, a few months ago uh, studying this particular passage in the midst of studying uh, Hebrews in my own devotions uh, and opening up uh, John Owen uh, and his, his wonderful commentaries on Hebrews, um, I wanted to think more about this and and, uh, and, and encourage others to think about the same. The author or preacher of Hebrews is fully aware of the church's problems. He understands that there are deadly plagues that are plaguing the body of Christ. Rather, however, rather than ignore or dismiss these spiritual contagions, he confronts them head on. He doesn't want them to take root and spread. Why? Because he's a faithful pastor. One day the Lord will call many of you to be a pastor. And, and to be a faithful pastor, uh, you cannot let these kinds of things grow and spread. You see, this author of Hebrews loved the church. John Owen writes this, quote, It is the duty of all faithful ministers of the gospel to consider diligently what failures and temptations their flocks are liable or exposed unto, so as to apply suitable means for their preservation. In this section of Hebrews, the church is being exhorted and admonished through powerful metaphors. These metaphors are both athletic and horticultural. And he begins the athletic metaphor uh, at the beginning of chapter 12 at the beginning of chapter 12. Now, I, I especially appreciate athletic uh, uh, metaphors because I used to play soccer uh, professionally. And uh, it was my life for 20 years. And, and I even have been on a missions trip with Will Traub uh, using soccer as a way to bring in uh, immigrants to share the gospel. That was a wonderful trip uh, that we took uh, together many, many years ago. I don't think we had as much gray hair then, Will. Um, but here we are. But in, in chapter 12, verse 1, the author writes, Therefore, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Let us run with endurance. The Christian life, the Christian ministry is not a sprint. It's not a, you start and then you, you finish in, in just a short amount of time, and, uh, and you get the medal put around uh, your neck. No, it is a marathon. 
The preacher compares the Christian life to a race, and his athletics metaphor resumes in verses 12 through 14 of our text that we're looking at now. He exhorts God's people to, quote, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. But rather be healed. In other words, he is urging the church to be roused from their spiritual lameness due to doctrinal compromise and to return to the straight paths of Christian truth and practice. Now, it would have made some sense for me in this verse if it said, uh, so that your hamstring doesn't get pulled, uh, because I pulled it this morning uh, running around Arthur's seat. Uh, there are all kinds of injuries you can get from running. The point Paul is making here is that if we continue to allow these poisonous doctrines to to come into the church and to spread around in the church, and there is no man to stand up and say, this must stop, it is wrong, and here is the truth, uh, we will continue down a very bad path. And so he urges them to be healed before they are put out of joint. Some in the church were like distance runners who had wandered off course. They were lost, they were slumped over, they were exhausted. Their hands were hanging down, their knees were devoid of strength, they were unsteady, they were accommodating error for the sake of unity and peace. John Owen explains that by the preacher's words, quote, that which is lame, the apostle peculiarly intends those that would retain the Jewish ceremonies and worship together with the doctrine of the gospel. For hereby they were made weak and infirm in their profession as being defective in light, resolution, and steadiness. As also, he continues to write, seemed to halt between two opinions, as the Israelites of old between Jehovah and Baal. This was that which was lame at that time among the Hebrews. And it may, by analogy, be extended unto all those who are under the power of such vicious habits, inclinations, or neglects, as weaken and hinder men in their spiritual progress. And so shouldn't we be compelled to ask, no matter what background we are from, no matter which church we, we come to or are training for, should we not be compelled to ask when studying a text like this, in what ways might we as denominations, as churches, be, quote, made weak and infirm in our profession as being defective in light, resolution, and steadiness. Now, I would argue that the subtle and sometimes not so subtle accommodation of certain aspects of our current moral revolution has made us weak and infirm and is close to putting us out of joint. These accommodations of, of, of particular facets of the cultural revolution uh, is the biggest threat to the spiritual health and future viability of our churches. You see church after church, pastor after pastor, even denominations who are allowing these things to creep in and they are destroying ministries. Some would say that the PCA is the kind of uh, strong uh, you know, battleship of Presbyterianism in the United States. Maybe people aren't saying that anymore. I don't know. But uh, I'm here to tell you that we, we have things that we need to, to work through. Uh, there are challenges to the orthodox of our own denomination, orthodoxy of our own denomination. Uh, just this past week, uh, one of our own uh, ministers, who is a minister in good standing in the PCA, I was speaking in the Revoice Conference, and some of you will know about the Revoice Conference and its push of side B gay Christianity, which many, many Christians and leaders who struggle with same-sex attraction are speaking out against because they understand that they are not teaching biblical truth about human sexuality. In fact, at the Revoice Conference, again, where one of our ministers uh, is one of the main speakers every year and whose church hosted it, 
uh, one of the speakers uh, refer, it's a, it's a woman who dresses like a man and wants to be referred to as they, them. They are going to seminary. Who? You and who? No, just, just me. I'm a they. Um, so two years ago, folks who would have been defending Revoice are now seeing things continue down the path of the way these things so often go. This moral revolution has overwhelmed Western civilization and is especially manifested in the LGBTQ plus and critical social justice movements. Intersectionality is the new reigning religion in the West and her prophets, priests, and rulers are seated on the highest thrones of earthly power. Now, we need to be able to, uh, as those who want a, a warm-hearted piety, who want our churches to be loving and welcoming and, and full of zeal for Christ and compassion for the lost, to be able to stand firm on the truth of Scripture and to do so in a way that is loving, kind. Um, this is not some sort of a blast, uh, uh, like, well, we've sort of got it all together, and so you need to get your business together before you come join us. This is not a sign out in front of the church that there are certain people that aren't welcome. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Uh, but we must stand firm for the sake of the world. We need to be against the world, the world's values, in order to be for the world uh, uh, as we reach out to them with, with the unadulterated truth of Scripture. A mission approach to world mission that seeks to accommodate the culture in order to reach the culture will be reaching the culture with something different than what the apostles preached. In a culture much more <laughs> down the line, uh, in fact, it had, it had never received the, the gospel, it had never known churches, uh, uh, and, and so they were in these idolatrous uh, perverse cultures and they were preaching an unadulterated gospel, ought we not uh, to do the same? Sadly, this insidious revolution has found a foothold in a growing number of our own churches in the PCA. And I wish this were not true. Um, what is perhaps even more concerning than the ministers who positively and publicly affirm aspects of these false ideologies of social justice and side B gay Christianity are those who quietly acquiesce to them, who quietly acquiesce to them, reluctantly accepting error without protest. That is a group that ends up killing denominations who aren't going to be for these things, are going to be reluctant as it concerns those things, but are not going to say a word. This quiet acquiescence is a spiritual cancer to ministers and to denominations. John Owen is right when he said, quote, a hesitation or doubtfulness in or about important doctrines of truth will make men lame, weak, and infirm in their profession. They will be out of joint. Therefore, there must be no hesitation as it concerns the sufficiency of the gospel and the divinely appointed means of grace for the discipleship and mission of the church. We don't need Side B, we don't need CRT, we don't need cultural accommodation. Nobody needs this. We have the gospel. We have the gospel. We have the same gospel that the apostles proclaimed. We have the same gospel that John Knox proclaimed from 1560 to 1572 just down the street. We have the same gospel that is the power of God unto salvation for those who believe. Paul Paul says it, doesn't he, in Romans 1, 16 and 17, that he is not ashamed of this gospel. And he's writing this from Corinth as he writes the churches in Rome. And he says, I'm not ashamed. Why? Because it, that gospel, that message, is the operative power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. That's the gospel that you are studying Brothers, that's the gospel that you are going to have the privilege to proclaim uh, from pulpits, and it must be an unadulterated one. Now, this text also says that we are to strive for peace and holiness. The preacher continues in verse 14, you'll notice, by exhorting the church to strive for peace with everyone 
and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Christians have a moral duty to pursue peace with everyone, especially those in the household of God. Indeed, it's sinful and unchristlike to be contentious or quarrelsome or divisive. By God's grace, we must strive for peace with one another. However, the pursuit of peace has its limits. Peace must never be sought apart from holiness. Peace must never be sought apart from the pursuit of holiness. In other words, Christians are never to pursue peace with any man, whether inside or outside the church, if it contradicts the word of God. John Owen, again, he writes this, we must eternally bid defiance unto that peace with men, which is inconsistent with peace with God. We don't make peace with man and, and, and unbiblical doctrine when clearly it's a contradiction of God's truth. Paul writes in Romans 12, 18, if possible, live peaceably with all. If possible. Regrettably, it's not possible to live peaceable with those who are determined to perpetuate doctrinal error and who negotiate holiness. The pursuit of peace, therefore, must always be in accordance with holiness, without which no man will see the Lord. Now, of course, I'm talking about particularly here relationships uh, within the church, within denominations, and I'm, ne I'm never talking about uh, getting in shouting matches or being unkind. Uh, or, or ungracious, but there's no true peace, there's no true unity if it is not in the truth, particularly in a, in a denomination where people are taking vows uh, to confess the faith um, of a, a particular confession. And so that's really important uh, to remember. Uh, this uh, a week ago when I was traveling over to the UK, I, I was... Um, uh, providentially uh, bumped up to first class, and I uh, was just telling my wife uh, that I'd forgotten my my earphones, and I wanted to sort of, you know, just uh, listen to some things and podcasts, whatever, and just sort of uh, be by myself as being a terrible, terrible Christian, and wasn't thinking about evangelizing the person next to me. Uh, but it was wonderful. I, I, I sat down, and this uh, lady began to talk to me. And uh, without spending too much time, uh, she was really engaging me a lot. And uh, we talked for 90 minutes straight. And by the end of the conversation, I realized that this was, um, uh, and, and she was very engaging, very interesting, very smart. And I found out she's a, a four-time New York Times bestseller, uh, liberal political activist, uh, and uh, former Democratic presidential candidate. Uh, and uh, here we are, and I, ha I had the privilege of sharing my testimony with her and sharing the gospel with her, and, and uh, she may even come and have dinner with my wife and me uh, in, in December when she is back in the Charleston area. It's just extraordinary the way the Lord opens up these opportunities, but, but that, that's a different scenario when you're talking about someone who is uh, you know, not within our denomination, who hasn't taken vows to the confession. Uh, and so... Paul goes from an athletic metaphor to a garden metaphor, and I know we are, uh, are, are limited on time here, but he tells us to pull up the root of bitterness, doesn't he? We know what it's like to have weed problems in our gardens. If we're not vigilant, our gardens can quickly become an assortment of weeds spreading throughout the yard, choking out the grass and the flowers. Interestingly, in verse 15 of our text, the preacher changes his metaphor from athletics to horticulture. And he exhorts the church to see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. Why does he issue this sober uh, warning to the Hebrews? Well, because there were some in the church who were empty professors, professing to be orthodox and godly believers. They were in reality sexually immoral and profane. They were like Esau, forsaking the eternal blessings of the covenant of grace for temporal comforts, for fading pleasures. They were slaves of sin and not slaves of righteousness. In that miserable condition, devoid of faith and repentance, these empty professors would fail to obtain the grace of God. What was this root of bitterness? Why did it pose such a clear and present danger for the church? Well, this phrase finds its origin in Deuteronomy 29, 18, and 19. You can look that up 
later. But by quoting this passage, the preacher is warning the Hebrews about the root of bitterness that strengthens hypocrisy in the church, often through sexual deviancy. And it inclines the heart towards apostasy. It, it leads to the defilement of many in the church. It's the poisonous root that J. Gresham Machen warned of during his fight for orthodoxy in the mainline Presbyterian Church in America, a root that many chose to ignore for the sake of ecclesiastical peace and toleration and unity. It's also important to remember that roots are hidden. They can't be readily seen or spreading seen spreading. In the same way, bitter roots of hypocrisy, doctrinal compromise, and perverse views and practices of, of, of sexuality are often hidden from view. But at one point, these, these roots, they break forth and they begin to, to come into focus. And they must be courageously confronted and uprooted through loving discipline in the church. The spiritual health of the church depends on it. Listen to what John Owen says, quote, spiritual evils in churches are progressive. From small, imperceptible beginnings, they will grow and increase to the worst of evils. And it will hence follow, he writes, that it is the duty of churches to watch against the first risings and entrances of such evils among them, which is here given them in charge. Again, he writes, church inspection is a blessed ordinance and duty, which is designed by Christ himself as a means to prevent these contagious evils in churches. And the neglect of it is that which hath covered some of them with all manner of defilements. This is not talking about witch hunts, about being those who are self-righteously exacting. But when men stand up in pulpits and say things so clearly contrary to our confession of faith, to the word of God, uh, we must rise up and speak clearly and lovingly and compassionately and courageously in our churches. The siren songs of progressive Christianity have seduced and ensnared the heart of the evangelical world. So many in America, this is true. We must not let it happen to us. We cannot let it happen to us and to our churches. Future generations of Christians will judge us on the way we respond to these challenges. What will be our story? Dear friend, what will be your story? What will be your story? Will they learn about denominations, about leaders that accommodated poisonous cultural trends in the name of contextualization? Will they read about churches and ministers that allowed a bitter root of compromise to grow and spread in its own garden, a church that pursued peace without holiness? Will they find out about churches that slowly became a refuge for theological ambiguity and confessional indifferentism or latitudinarianism? Will they read about denominations and churches and leaders that chose to forge a doctrinal via media for the sake of toleration and peace and counterfeit unity? Or will they learn about something different? Will they hear about men who stood firm who did not shrink back from declaring the whole counsel of God? Will they hear about churches and ministers and seminaries that courageously rejected the powerful secular ideologies of their age and instead chose to follow the old and worn paths of ministry, mission, and discipleship? Well, I want to encourage you this afternoon uh, to be those men who do not shrink back, who stand firm in these old and worn paths of discipleship, to the glory of God. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you so much for this time together and for the joy of your word that it brings to us, that it encourages conviction and thus courage in the midst of a challenging moment in our culture. Lord, fill these men with your spirit as you raise them up to be faithful preachers of your word. Wherever you may send them, Lord, would you go with them and bless them in their ministries, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.